Good evening. Thank you for having me. I'm Jim Buffington. I am on the management team of Bridges to Life and I started out as a volunteer with Bridges to Life in 2004 and I joined the management team in 2016. And I'm here today to just share my story and hopefully it'll, uh, it'll help you through this process. Uh, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas. I am the oldest son of uh, three boys. My dad was the church music minister and my mom was the church piano player uh, in San Antonio. I, I grew up, I thought, pretty lucky. I had my parents together, my two younger brothers. Uh, my grandparents are also in the same city and I don't have any bad memories growing up. I, I thought I was pretty lucky. Uh, I was really surrounded by family and church, so I was pretty sheltered. Um, but I, that, that's what I knew, and I, I thought I was really pleased with my family life. Um, in junior high school, my parents got divorced. I, I didn't know what a divorce was because all my grandparents were still together. Uh, I never heard my parents argue, so I didn't understand it. Um, and as most of you know, if you've been through a divorce, it, it just kind of tears a family apart. And so we got bounced between my mom's house and my dad's house for another year. Uh, at the end of my seventh grade, uh, my dad went out of town for the weekend and we were supposed to be with my mom, but a change of plans, we stayed with some friends. And it was on a Saturday night in the spring of, of March and um, the police described the scene as a, uh, a rape and robbery that went wrong. Uh, two men had held my mom up at gunpoint. They uh, stole her purse. They stole her jewelry off of her. Uh, the, the two men then raped my mom in the back seat of her car. And then one of the men took a gun and shot my mom uh, in the face at close range three times. They, they left my mom uh, without her clothes on on the back seat floorboard of her own car in a junior high school parking lot. Um, I, immediately I had this fear that was attached to me. I, I couldn't figure out why would anybody want to harm my mom? Why are they going to come after me? I, I remember my dad came back to town and my brothers and I, we just held on to him because we were scared to death. Um, a lot of times when a family member dies, uh, the rest of the family wants to go see the body because that's where we know it, it's real. And so we went to the funeral home to see my mom and my dad warned us. He said, Jim, you need to stay way far away from the casket because it, it doesn't look like her. When, when you're shot three times in the face, it just didn't look like my mom anymore. Uh, we had a closed casket funeral because we didn't want anybody to see my mom like that. She was no longer that attractive lady uh, that she once was. We, we got to the funeral and then we're living with my dad and we're trying to get back to normal. And, and by the way, when you're a victim of a homicide as a family member, normal never returns. And so the next year we're living with my dad, trying to adjust to life without my mom. And my dad had a side business, he had a construction business. And a year later, it was the end of my eighth grade year in, uh, in May, my dad was arrested. He was charged with um, criminal solicitation of hiring two men to murder my mom. He was also charged with capital murder. My dad went before the judge for a bail hearing. And I remember um, the judge said, bail denied, bond denied. And what that meant for me is I had already lost my mom to murder. Now I'm losing my dad uh, to jail. It, it's going to take three or four years before you go to trial for capital murder. So uh, the, the other thing that changed for me is when my mom was killed, I was a victim's kid and, and people really help victims and their families. And, and so they were very kind to us, wanted to help. But when my dad was arrested, all of a sudden I was an offender's kid and, and I got treated differently. I, um, my family, my, some of our, my teachers, they, they just treated me like an offender, even though it was my dad that was in jail and not me. Uh, we moved in with my aunt and uncle and I started high school. And for the next uh, two years, I'd go visit my dad 
every every weekend in the county jail awaiting his trial. But, uh, by the way, the trial uh, that he was waiting was a circumstantial case. Uh, the two men involved, one, one said, oh, I didn't do it, he did it. And, and the other man that was arrested said, no, I didn't do it, he did it, and they overheard my dad hiring him. So basically, it was two men that were pointing the finger at each other, as well as my dad that, were, that was arrested. So uh, finally, my dad goes to trial. I'm 16 years old. Um, my dad's capital murder trial lasted about three months, and all 12 jurors found my dad guilty of capital murder and criminal solicitation, and they sentenced my dad to the death penalty to be executed at the LSU unit in Huntsville. Um, it, it's one thing to be the son of a man who's in the county jail. It's completely different to be the son of a man who's on death row. Uh, people really treated us differently. So some would describe my brothers and I as damaged goods. You know, th those boys won't amount to anything. Well, I I'm, it's my dad that's on death row, it's not me. But that's what happens with offenders' families. They get treated as part of the sentence that the offender gets sentenced. It's not fair, it's just how it is. Uh, it was too much for us, it was in the news. Uh, I go to high school, people knew my family situation, that my dad was uh, convicted of hiring two men to murder my mom. And so uh, it was too much for us. So we moved in with my aunt, uh, excuse me, my, my grandparents in Arkansas. I finished high school in Arkansas, and then I went to college in Arkansas, and uh, I'd go visit my dad. Uh, usually once a month, my brothers and I would make the road trip from Arkansas to Huntsville, where death row was to go visit my dad. I, I love my dad. I, I believed in my dad. He said he didn't do this. And he, he said, Jim, keep the faith. I didn't do this. And my senior year in college, this lady comes forward. She was the DA's assistant, the, the prosecutor's assistant in my dad's case. And she said, there's some men on death row that shouldn't be there. And she confessed the DA was just convinced that my dad was guilty, couldn't prove it, so he altered evidence, he changed some evidence. Well, that got my dad off death row and back to San Antonio County Jail to get a new trial. He was gonna hopefully get a second fair trial. So uh, I graduated college, I got married right out of college to my wife, Marilyn. We've been married over 30 years. And um, I remember taking my wife to meet my dad in prison for the first time. You know, Marilyn, the lady I love, this is my dad who I love. And I wanted those two people to meet. Well, what I didn't realize was that was a big deal for Marilyn because she had never been exposed to prison. And what I realized is I need to be careful what I get used to. Be, be careful what you get your kids used to. It shouldn't be normal for someone to come visit somebody in prison. But to me, it was normal. Um, my wife and I visited my dad for the next three years, um, awaiting his second trial. Fast forward, I'm now 26 years old and I'm, uh, I'm testifying for my dad's case. I'm a fact witness. And so my wife and I attended my dad's trial and uh, it lasted about three months. And uh, the jury was given two choices. <clears throat> they could either find my dad guilty of capital murder or they could find, find him guilty of a lesser charge of murder, which would be life in prison. Um, if he got the life sentence, he was eligible for parole, and the parole board had already voted that he was gonna be released. Well, sure enough, it goes to the jury, and uh, 11 of the 12 took a vote, and they said not guilty of anything. Uh, but there was this one guy, uh, the 12th juror, who, who said he, he, he's got to be guilty because he's been to prison. And, and you should know a, a lot of people will judge you just because you're in prison. And that's what this man was doing. He wasn't judging my dad on the evidence. He was judging him just because he'd been arrested. It's not fair. It's not right. It's just how it is. That lasted about three days. The jury came back. All 12 said on the charge of capital murder, they found my dad not guilty guilty, which meant my dad would never, ever be executed. I, I had already lost my mom to murder. I didn't want to lose my dad 
to an execution. I didn't want him to go through that. I didn't want to go through that. Um, on the charge of murder, they said guilty, and they gave him life in prison. I know it seems odd. I was so excited that my dad was found guilty of murder because it meant he was coming home. Because what happens as family members of offenders is we spend our entire focus on how do we get you home? How do we get you out of prison? And so that was my whole life focus. And we were just so happy that my dad was finally getting home. That night, my wife and I and my dad's attorney met with my dad at the county jail. And he's about to be released from prison. And, and I had some notes. I, I'm a real organized guy. I, I have a, a lot of, uh, I had a lot of questions. And it wasn't questions about my dad. It was questions about my mom and some things that came up in the trial. And my dad said, Jim, ask me anything. And so I asked my dad, and I got to a particular question, and he said, Jim, um, I did it, and she deserved it. He confessed. Um, I immediately uh, felt betrayed. I was angry. I was ashamed that I had testified for my dad, who is now confessing to me that he killed my mom. The worst part is he thought he was the victim because he was in prison. And I said, Dad, you're not the victim. My mom, who is dead, is the victim. But a lot of men in prison think that they're the victim because they're in prison. That's not the case. I will tell you, I, I protested my dad's parole. I, I got everybody I knew, my dad's parents, my dad's brother, all of my mom's side of the family who had been supportive of him, we all protested. My two brothers, every, all of our family protested. We went back to the parole board, they re-voted, and they said, parole denied. I went back to tell my dad the news. I said, Dad, you're not getting out. We have all turned on you. You're going back to Ellis Unit, but you're going to, not death row, death row's safe. You're isolated. You're going to general population at a maximum security prison. And I told him, I said, you will never see me again. I, I checked him off. I said, Dad, I don't want anything to do with you. Well, the next year, my wife and I had our son, Bryce. Um, by the way, Bryce is now grown and he's also a volunteer with Bridges Life. And so he and I volunteered the same unit together. But I remember when my son was born, it was bothering me because I'm a lot like my dad. I look like my dad, I sound like my dad. I, I do a lot of the things that he did. And, and what was really bothering me is, is how did my dad go from a happily married guy to with an attractive lady with three good boys, a leader in his church, to a killer? The other thing that was really bothering us is we found out at that second trial, he not only hired those two men to kill my mom, he hired those men to also kill me and my brother Oscar and my brother Lewis. We were 12, 11, and 10 years old. He had hired them, these two men, to kill all of us for life insurance. So I, um, it, it bothered me that he could do that. And so three years went by, and I finally said, I've got to go back to see my dad in prison because I need to know how did he go from a happily married guy to a killer because I'm just like him. So I went to go see him um, at the Ellis unit, and it was a, an open room and uh, for a, a contact visit. Uh, I, grew, I had grown up on death row, so whenever I visited my dad, he had on a phone and there was a big piece of glass and I had a phone. I hadn't physically touched my dad since I was 13 years old and here I am 29 years old. And so when I went in, I wasn't expecting him to be in an open room and he stands up and he, he wants to hug me. He thought I was coming back to restore a father and a son relationship. And, and I looked at him, I said, Dad, I'm not here to make up. I, I'm here to find out how did you go from a happily married guy to a killer because unfortunately I'm just like you and I hate it. First thing my dad said was, Jim, I'm sorry for what I did to you. I'm sorry for what I did to your brothers. And I'm, I'm sorry for what I did to your mom. And it surprised me because he was one of those men who always thought he was right. He had an attitude of always being right. I think a lot of men struggle uh, with an attitude of 
they're always right. And, and I struggle with that. And the next thing he told me, he said he, he had not had a visit, phone call, money on his account, anything for three years. Everybody he knew had turned their back on him, his own parents, his brother, his three kids. And he, and I, and I was not upset about that. And I said, well, good. <laughs> and he said, Jim, I'm, I'm not here to try to explain and make you feel sorry for you. I'm, I'm trying to, for me, and he said, I'm, I'm trying to explain that I hit rock bottom in prison and I finally asked God in my life and I've changed. And I'll be honest, I didn't believe him. I, I've been a volunteer in prison ministry for many years and a lot of, a lot of folks will come to prison, they say they find God and then when they get out of prison, they throw their Bible in the trash can and they come back and it's just a cycle. And, and so I wasn't believing him. But, but here's, here's what he said, here's his story. Um, I said, Dad, how did you go from happily married guy to killer? For, for him, he said, it started with just making some bad choices. The first thing he said, he started going to happy hours right after work. Uh, what that led to is him not coming home. Uh, here my mom worked all day, fed us dinner, helped us with our homework, put us to bed, and my dad is at a bar spending all their money, coming home in the morning, and uh, he'd get home and my mom and him would get an argument and his next bad choice, he started cheating on my mom. He, he started, uh, he had an affair and my mom caught him. And my mom did the right thing. She, she said, let's save our family, gave him a second chance. Let's get some counseling and save our family. But what does my dad do? He keeps going to the bar, spending the money, keeps coming home late, drunk. The next bad choice, he gets home one morning. My mom's mad because she should be because husbands and dads go home. They get in an argument. He punches my mom in the face. He hit my mom in the face, gave her a black eye. I, you don't hit a lady, especially my mom. Well, my mom did the right thing. She said, I put up with you drinking, never coming home. I put up with you cheating. I'm not putting up with you hitting me. She filed for divorce. I think that was the right decision. That, that's called a consequence. Um, my dad is mad because he couldn't believe that she had the nerve to leave him. And so he's in a bar. And um, you read the Bible, it says, bad company corrupts good character. Um, that is true. Who you hang out with is, a lot of times, is who you become. And so he's in this bar. He's mad at my mom. And he says something. He said, I sure wish she was dead. And as we know, a lot of times when you say something, your words will take a life of its own. And his next bad choice, how much would that cost me? Next bad choice, you know what? I want to be rich, free, and single. I'm going to take a bunch of life insurance out on my wife and my three kids. And so for $2,000, $2,000, he hires these two men to murder my mom and me and my brothers. And boom, that was his last choice. And so what I realized is, it wasn't a one-time decision to kill his whole family. It was a lot of choices. And I know, and you know, once you make a couple of bad choices, the next ones get easier. I started visiting my dad once a month. And, and, and I will tell you, I went through a forgiveness process. And people ask me all the time, how could you forgive the man who tried to kill you and had your mom murdered? And, and all I know, just from my work with working with crime victims, is a lot of times if a victim doesn't forgive their offender, they become bitter, angry, and depressed. And, and I didn't want to be that person. And I didn't want my dad to control me so that I would become bitter and angry and depressed. So I actually forgave my dad not to let him off the hook, but to let me off the hook. And so for the next year, I visited him once a month and we went through a forgiveness process. I will tell you, I forgave my dad and we restored our father-son relationship. However, it doesn't mean there wasn't a consequence. Even though I forgave my dad, I still protested his parole each year because as a family member, I feel that if um, you kill my mom and have her found raped and, and wrong, that it's my duty as her son to protest his parole. That, that's called a consequence. That consequence is separate from our relationship. 
Um, a year goes by and I get a phone call from the chaplain at the prison and he said, Jim, something's happened to your dad. You need to get down here quickly. Well, what happened is um, my dad had a brain aneurysm. It's a blood vessel that pops in your brain and, and on, in route on the helicopter to the, the prison hospital, he died. And so by the time we got there, he was brain dead, but he was still hooked up on life support. We had to uh, remove him from life support and he died in prison that day. Well, what happens in prison, if you die, you're either buried on the prison grounds or at, your, at the family's expense, you can claim the body and have a private funeral. So we had a private funeral for my dad in San Antonio and we, we got a call from the warden and the warden said, Jim, this has never happened in the history of the Texas prison system. This was in 94, but there's, this has never happened, but we want to allow a memorial service for your dad in the prison and we want you and your family to attend. Well, I'll be honest, we, we didn't want to do it. We were so tired of being in the system. We've gone through eight capital murder trials. We just wanted to bury my dad and be done with it, but it wasn't over. So the next week, uh, myself, my brothers, Oscar and Lewis and our wives, we went to my dad's memorial service. Uh, we went into death row. We toured death row where my dad lived. We also went into general population where my dad lived after his second trial. And then we went to a chapel and it was very ironic. On one end of the hall of the prison is the chapel of life and the other end of the hall is death row. Kind of ironic. So, so we walk into a chapel, it's a room like this and a bunch of, bunch of rows of, of inmates. There were about 300 inmates in white prison uniforms, both death row and general population. And we, so we knew something was up. But what we didn't know is my dad had a job. He was the minister of music at the chapel and started a men's choir. And um, I, I know the Bible talks about restoring your soul and he guides you in paths of righteousness. Well, my dad was restored. He was the minister of music in prison. So we hear this Christian songs and we thought, well, that, that's kind of neat. And, but here's what happened next. One by one, 300 inmates for over the next three hours walked up to this, this podium and they looked me straight in the face and they said, I became a Christian because your dad shared Christ with me and it's changed my life. When you hear one person say it, it's pretty impactful. But when you hear 300, 300 men say the same thing, we knew my dad had changed. Because, you know, you can do and say things when everybody's looking, but who you really are is what you do and say when nobody's looking. And when nobody was looking, my dad would meet a man in prison and he would tell his story. We all have a story. And, you know, he made all these bad choices, but he asked God in his life. He took accountability and responsibility for his actions. God forgave him and he changed his life. Um, at the end of that service, the, the chaplain asked if I wanted to say anything. And, and so I stood up, I, I turned around, I looked at this room full of 300 inmates in white prison uniforms. And the only thing I could say was, Please don't judge me. I'm not judging you. The only difference between us is you made a bad choice that got you in prison that I haven't made. And what I learned from these men is a lot of folks in prison struggle with forgiving themselves because they've been labeled, you know, whether they're a murderer or a thief or, or whatever their charge is. And what I explained is you don't have to let that label define you. That does not have to be who you are. And, and many times you need to ask God for forgiveness and, and, and forgive yourself and let yourself off the hook so you don't become bitter, angry, depressed. And, and so I left that day and um, I started volunteering at victims at the Texas Victim Services, telling our story in prisons and churches. And, and, and I ended up meeting a staff member uh, with Bridges to Life and I attended a graduation. And at the graduation, at the 14th week of Bridges Life, men will walk up and they share how they've changed, what they learned. And it looked just like my dad's memorial service. And I realized men can change, women can change in prison. And so I started volunteering and uh, for, for several years and there was finally an opportunity 
through Texas called the Victim Offender Mediation Dialogue. And I had an opportunity to meet Charles, the man that shot my mom. And so how it's set up is the state assigns a counselor, a mediator. He can counsel Charles, then he counseled me, and he said, finally, you two guys should meet. And so I go to meet with Charles all day in a, in a private room, and it's Charles, it's me, it's the mediator and a prison guard. And the first thing that Charles did is he walked up to me and he wanted to shake my hand. And I will tell you, I immediately felt anger towards the stranger. He, he raped and murdered my mom. I didn't even want to touch him. And, and uh, I came prepared and, and I brought pictures because I wanted him to understand the ripple effect of crime. And so I showed him pictures of my grandparents who, um, who when the police told my grandmother she passed out, when, like here's a picture of my grandfather. He had to go identify his daughter's body, which was really difficult since her, her face was, was shot. And I, I explained to Charles that my grandfather was a healthy man, but because he killed my mom, my grandfather never could get over it. And a few months later, he died. He, I said, Charles, you, you killed my grandfather. And then I explained all of our family members and how they found out. And, and, and here's a picture of my wife who never met her mother-in-law because of you, Charles. Here's my son, Bryce. He never met his grandmother because of you. And I went through all these photos of people that he impacted and he never thought about. What, what Charles said to me, he said, you don't understand. And he started telling me about how his parents got divorced. And I said, so did mine. His dad was an alcoholic. So was mine. My favorite is when he said, well, my dad was in prison. And I said, well, so was mine. What Charles and I realized is we had the same story. Why did he end up in prison? And, and I didn't. We talked about choices. Um, I finally needed some answers. And I needed Charles to tell me what happened to my mom. And um, I, he was too honest, let's just say. And he was telling me what was going on in that backseat of my mom's car. Um, and I realized that they were trying to find me. One of the first questions they asked Charles and his accomplice was, where are the boys? And we weren't with my mom. And I realized from Charles that my mom saved my life. And I didn't know that, only he knew that. There's so many questions that victims of crime have and only the offenders can answer those questions. So at one point, uh, I got a little angry and I'll be honest, I, I wanted to reach over and I wanted to strangle that old man. But I stood up and I walked away. The Bible tells us, he says, uh, uh, God tells us, um, get rid of all bitterness rage and every form of malice and, and, and I had to walk away and then I came back and I looked at Charles and I said Charles I almost killed you um, I had to forgive him and, and that took a while um, he he wanted me to forgive him immediately and I just couldn't do it um, I got home that night and I will tell you my brothers and my son wanted to know all the details and, and I'll give a lot of credit to my wife for raising our son Bryce, who was awesome. But, but I changed Bryce's life that day. Because you know why? Bryce at the time was getting ready to head off to college. And if I had killed Charles and my, my dad was a killer, here, here's my son who's going off to college. And if he's faced with a similar situation and his dad's a killer and his grandfather's a killer, how much easier is it going to be for him to do the same thing that his dad did and his grandfather did? I changed my son's life that day. You can change your kid's life by your future choices. Um, I uh, was looking through some papers recently and uh, I had forgotten that my mom, she knew that somebody was trying to kill her. She just didn't know who it was. And in her safety deposit box was her will and her funeral service. And, and she wanted one song sung at her service. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a 70s song. It's called, I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed as name to bear. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'll take him with me anywhere. 
I'll tell the world how Jesus saved me and how he gave me a life brand new. And I know that if you trust him, that all he gave me, he'll give to you. I'll tell the world that he's my savior. No other one could love me so. My life, my all is his forever. And where he leads me, I will go. For when he comes and life is over, for those who love him, there's more to be. Eyes have never seen the wonders that he's preparing for you and me. Oh, tell the world that you're a Christian. Be not ashamed his name to bear. Oh, tell the world that you're a Christian and take him with you anywhere. What I what it really struck me is that my mom knew she was facing death. She just didn't know who was trying to kill her. But she took the time to leave a message for me and my brothers. She had already forgiven. And, and what I've learned is if, if she could forgive and leave this message, I, I'm going to do what she said, is I'm going to tell the world about our story and uh, how we experience forgiveness and God's healing in our life. And it's our choice, and it's your choice as well. Thank you.